we would found the Word, and we had found the church, and we had found reforms, but we hadn't found God. If you can't live with your queen at home and your children at home, you're putting on a face at church. You're playing church. And God doesn't want you just to play to the church. He wants you to find Him. He wants to empower you. He wants to empower your marriage and your family. You see, to abide in Christ is to surrender all our known choices to Christ in the present moment. That's a living Well, I am thrilled to be here tonight. I, I can't tell you what happened to me when I walked into your church here tonight because your church had asked me to speak from my first book on Escape to God. And two of the people that influenced me to write this book are here tonight. And I didn't know they were going to be here. I didn't even know they were members of your church. Jack and Judy uh, Kendall over here. I don't know if it was eight or nine. I don't know how long ago. You would probably know. We were at a camp meeting where I was speaking at in Oregon years ago, and Jack turned around and said to me, Jim, you got to put this in writing. And I said, Jack, I'm not a writer. I hate grammar. I'm not putting it in writing. You remember that, Jack? Some, some to that extent. I said, you can write. I'm not writing. And then uh, I was speaking in California, was it, uh, Robin? And Robin picked me up at the airport. And she says, Jim, there's this old lady that's dying that just wants to see you. And would you come, would, would, would you stop and see her first before the meetings? And I says, well, what kind of time schedule are we on? And I don't know how old Eleanor was. Do you, Robin? 74 years old, and she was in a, a nursing home type situation. She didn't have many days left. And I says, yeah, let's stop and see Eleanor, you know. And I, I'll never forget, I walked in the room. And this elderly lady that I never met, when I walked in the room, she said, Jim Holmberger, Jim Holmberger, you, come here, come here, Jim Holmberger. She had more life in her for a dying woman than anybody ever seen. And she says, bend over here. And I bent over and she says, God has told me you've got to put those messages on tape into a book. And I'm just, I mean, Jack told me that. And I, just, and I told the Lord, if you use a humble instrument to convince me, I'll, I'll go with it. And I just stood there. I was shaking. I was trembling. Because this boy that thought that grammar was something they tortured you with all the way through grade school and high school and college, now God's saying, I want you to write. And so God likes to use humble instruments because if you don't have the ability to do it, guess who gets the glory? And I don't have the ability to do that. God gets the glory. I don't. And so when I came in here tonight... I had to say thank you. Thank you, Jack and Judy, and thank you, Robin, because you've been instrumental. This book is being translated into 13 languages presently around the world. And people are, saying, people are using this in India. They're giving it away in India, and Hindus are coming to the Lord because they're saying, I want to know this man's God. This man's God is personal. This man, God, speaks to him and walks with him. My God doesn't. And so the Hindus in India from reading this book, are joining Christianity. Isn't God good? So, I had the privilege tonight of sharing some thoughts with you from my first book, which really comes from the book, God's Word. Because God's Word is really the end of it all, isn't it? And I take everything that I know and I love from that book and from my walk with Jesus Christ and if you can gain anything from me tonight, I hope it's that you will come closer to Christ, know that he's personal and real. And I want to talk to you tonight about what I call a bundle of choices. And when I moved to the wilderness of Montana, you know, I was first raised in Appleton, Wisconsin, and I came to, to accept God's word there. But after a little while there, we realized that we'd found the word and we'd found a church and we'd found reforms, but we hadn't found God. And so God impressed us to sell a successful practice, sell our business, sell our home, sell all our belongings, and move up in the wilderness, not to hide. That wasn't the reason for it. The reason that we went to the wilderness in 1983 was to find something. More than just knowledge. More than just a church. More than just reforms. It was to find an intimate, personal walk with Jesus, and then to take that into our marriage and take it into our family. 
And so when we moved there in 1983, we're right up next to Glacier National Park. We're 50 miles from power, up a gravel road. The grizzly bears actually walk in our front yard. In fact, I had an interesting experience just a few weeks ago where the grizzly bear came at about 3 o'clock in the morning. He was outside our window, and we have a bird feeder there. And that guy likes to rob the bird feeder. And I thought, I'm going to fix this character. I'm going to take care of him. And I thought, I'll open that window really quick, and I'll jump out the window and scare him to death. <laughs> well, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm tired. I can't see very good, and it's very dark. Well, I, I open the window real quick, and I jump out, and I come face to face with the bird feeder, and I thought it was the grizzly bear. I went back in just as fast as I came out. I scared myself to death. I think he's still laughing at me. So we literally have the bears in our front yard. I mean, it's wonderful. It's a good place to come to know God. But we came there for a reason. And we came there for the purpose of simplifying our lifestyle and finding that walk with God. But it wasn't just my lifestyle that needed simplifying. My theology needed simplifying, brothers and sisters. I was suffering from theology overload syndrome. Do you know what I'm talking about? I mean, I had only been into the church for four years, and I was confused. And so we went up to the wilderness. I was confused because I wasn't living what I was believing. I believed the doctrines we had, but I wasn't living what God's Word said. So we moved up to the mountains, and I said, Sally, we're going to find this deeper walk with Jesus. And so the first thing I did is I bought five books from the five leading theologians. And I said, I'm going to get to the bottom of this thing quick. And I read all five of those books. And when I was finished reading those books, I was more confused than I'd ever been in my entire life. None of them agreed. And as I went through those five books, terminology such, because none of them agreed, terminology such as justification, sanctification, glorification, righteousness by faith, imputed righteousness, imparted righteousness, forensic justification, legalism, universalism, cheap grace, Calvinism, antimonialism, behavioralists, perfectionists. The concepts were drowning me. Are you with me? I got a simple mind. I don't have a brilliant mind. And these concepts were drowning me. They were confusing me. They were stalling me in my Christian walk. And all the authors led me to believe that if I merely accepted their concepts intellectually, then I was okay. They had all substituted facts for faith. I didn't know it at the time. I'd accepted facts, but I didn't have the faith. May we not make facts our religion, brothers and sisters. Our religion needs to be a present experience in Jesus Christ. And that's what I was lacking. I had the facts, but I didn't have the faith. And so I was suffering from what I call conceptualism. You know, I can believe I'm a frog all I want, but will I pass the test when I sit on the lily pad? And if I translate that to you, I can believe I'm a Christian, but if I can't walk the walk successfully at home, behind closed doors, with my queen and my children, something's missing. Something's missing. I can't just look good when I come to church with a Bible under my arm, with a nice suit on, and I put on a pleasant face and demeanor for all you. This has to translate that when I'm at home after a busy, hectic day at the office, and I shut that door, and my wife says something that crosses me, my religion's got to work. The Bible says, by their what? You shall know them. It doesn't say by their theology. I think the devil understands our theology better than we do. And he's in trouble. Now, I'm not against theology. It's a tool, isn't it? But it's not our religion. And I had theology, but I didn't have a religion that taught me how to treat my wife like a queen. That's why we went to the wilderness. And so I was confused because something was missing. You know, I read about uh, a football a high school football team in Oklahoma. And they had produced a series of winning teams. Winning, winning, winning. And one man graduated from that high school on that team. And years later, that same high school, his alumnus was losing all the time. And homecoming was coming up. And they were going to play their arch rivals. This man had become a very successful automobile dealer, Ford automobile dealer. 
And he wanted his team to beat the opponent uh, high school so bad that he asked the coach, can I talk to this team? And the coach says, nothing else is working, go ahead. So this businessman proceeded to offer a brand new Ford to each player on that team if they beat their bitter rival. Quite an offer, isn't it? Well, the team went crazy with anticipation. They howled. Can you imagine the young boys? You know, they're, they're teenage boys, 17, 18 years old. I mean, they howled, they cheered, they bolstered each other up. For days, it was all they could talk about. The entire school was caught up in the concept uh, that they would be the winners. Each player could visualize themselves driving home in a brand new convertible. They talked winning. They believed winning. They ate and slept the concept that they would be the winning team. Finally, the big day came. The team was assembled in the locker room. Excitement was at an unprecedented high. The coach offered several last-minute instructions to all the players. The team assembled on the field. They put their hands together, as they always do, and they shouted simultaneously, Let's go! And they ran on the field, and they were demolished 38 to nothing. Yeah. Is that you? Do you believe you're on the winning team? You've joined God's remnant church, if you will. Do you believe there's a prize at the end? They tell you you're saved, you're going to heaven. But are you losing on the playing field at home with your wife, your children? I was. That was me. You know, it takes more than belief. Belief or concepts, when left to stand alone, make you a loser on the field in your own home. The whole Jewish nation believed they were on the winning team, didn't they? And only five of them recognized the Savior. They had the concept of the coming of the Messiah, but they didn't recognize the man when he came. How about us? Is that us today? I had the concepts. I had the belief system. I believed I was on that winning team. I believed I'd receive a prize at the end, but I was losing in the field at home. You ladies would not have wanted to be married to Jim Holmberger. Oh, I look good in my office. I treated all my customers with the utmost of respect. But when I came home, my wife would say things like, uh, gee, Mr. Schultz called. I says, what did he want? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I didn't ask him. Why didn't you ask him? What do you think happened to my wife's countenance? I was the head elder of the church. I could tell you all our doctrines. I was even a vegan. Eating all my carrots and my bananas. But at home behind closed doors, I was a loser, brothers and sisters, while belonging to this team. And that isn't just Jim Hohenberger. Our church and the Christian churches today are in trouble because we're not living the experience we believe is possible. We're missing something. And when you do that to your wife, gentlemen, you're going to carry the same concept through to your children. And what do our children do when they grow up? When, after they've seen that for 18 or 21 years, they're out. It's not that we didn't bring them to the right church. It's not that we didn't teach them the right doctrines, is it? They never saw it lived at home behind closed doors. And that was Jim Hohenberger. That's why I moved to the mountains. So, if your concepts, your beliefs, your theology, your religion isn't producing the fruit at home behind closed doors, brothers and sisters, something is wrong. And we have to learn to recognize that. So I want to talk to you about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want to make it just as simple as I possibly can, and I like to illustrate. So I'd like to share with you tonight three simple illustrations one is about Al, a Mormon businessman. The second uh, illustration is about Connie, an abused, rejected, tormented, lonely woman. And the third one is about a rope. And I pray as we go through these three illustrations that God will speak to you about the simplicity of the gospel. Because, brothers and sisters, I think we have missed the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. First, I want to talk to you about Al. Now, you've got to realize, I live up in the mountains, 50 miles from nothing, up a gravel road. And 
when I go to town, I've got a list of things to do. I can't just run around. It's an hour and a half into the grocery store. And so when I go to town, I've got a whole list of things to do, and it takes me the whole day. Because we only go to town maybe once every two or three weeks. And so it's a busy, it's a busy day. And on my way into town, I'm driving down there, and I'm impressed. Jim, I want you to stop and see Al. See, Al was a successful Mormon businessman. And I met Al when he came to my house with two Mormon missionaries. They stopped at my house to enlighten me about their religion. But God had a different plan in mind for Al. Instead of interesting me in Mormonism, God had other plans. Al became enthralled with our approach to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was practical. It applied to the life. And I found Al to be a very fascinating man because he was an independent thinker. I don't find a lot of that out there today. Al was not only an independent thinker, he was not afraid to examine his own belief system. It's a rare treat that endeared me to his heart. And that is why I found myself sitting across from Al in his office. Now, when I walked into Al's business, I didn't know that it was being remodeled. In his office, he had a, had a private office. He had taken his office, and it was sitting out in the middle of the secretarial pool. And so when I came in, and I'm sitting before Al, we've got four secretary desks sitting all around us, all these ears. Now, as I sat there and I looked at Al, Al said, Jim, why did you stop today? And I said, Al, God impressed me too. He says, thank you. I was praying you would stop today. Now I want to ask you a question. Are you under God's lordship or aren't you? Because if you say you're a Christian, that means you're not in charge of your life. You may have a whole list of things to do in town today, but if you say you're Jesus Christ, you're bought and sold by Jesus Christ, you come under his lordship. Jesus isn't just your savior, he's your lord. And Isaiah 30, 21 says, And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, I want you to stop and see Al today. Do you have that kind of walk with Jesus? I didn't used to have that kind of walk. When I, when I first came in the church, I ran my religion. I was in charge. I was the pilot. And when I came to the mountains, the Lord says, You can't be pilot anymore. I'm the pilot. You get in the co-pilot seat, Jim Moenberger. The whole issue in the scriptures, if you look at the scriptures, the whole issue from Genesis all the way through Revelation is one issue. Who is in charge of your life? Who's in charge of your lips? Who's in charge of your heart and your actions? The whole issue is, are you going to come under the lordship of Jesus Christ and his direction and his guidance, or are you going to run your affairs? Ouch. Now, where are you? See, when I was driving to town, I didn't want to stop and see Al. I even said to my lovely wife over here, Sally, I said, I don't have time. But I feel like I've got to stop and see Al. Where are we going to get the time for the rest of the things? And then I just said, Lord, that's all we ever have to do, Acts 9, 6. Lord, what would thou have me to do? The Lord says, Jim, I want you to stop and see Al today before you go into town. And so there I'm sitting before Al, and Al looks at me, he says, Jim, what are you doing here? So I told him, God told me to come and see you. He says, Jim, I'm confused. And as I sat there, when Al said that, remember, he's the owner of the company. When Al said to me, I'm confused, everything in that room stopped. Every secretary, every phone, four men had come in from the factory and they were standing against the wall and they just stopped. And I sat there, I'm not only looking at Al, I'm kind of looking around like this and everybody's listening. <laughs> this is a divine appointment. Amen. And Al looks at me, he says, Jim, I'm confused. And I says, Al, what is it? He says, yesterday, I was sitting in the Salt Lake City airport awaiting my flight to come home. He says, I couldn't help noticing a newly married couple that was just sitting a couple aisles across from me. He says, they were sitting there, but it wasn't that they were newly married. He says, it's that they had an open Bible in their lap and they were discussing it. 
He says, this man was a recently ordained evangelical minister, and he was heading for his first appointment. He says, they were so obviously in love, yet it was that open Bible that set them apart from everybody else. He says, as I observed them discreetly as possible, he says, always trying to avert their eyes, he says, every now and then their eyes would catch mine. He says, and then suddenly, the minister stands up, he comes walking right over in front of me, he looks at me. He says, sir, I couldn't help noticing your glances in my direction. He says, may I ask you a question? He says, if our flight crashed today and all of us died, would you be sure of eternal life? It's a good question, isn't it? And so my Mormon friend sits there for a while and he says, well, I, I think I would. And the, the evangelical minister says, that's not good enough. You must know. Now let me ask you again. If you were to die today, would you be saved? And Al says, I don't know. And as I'm sitting here listening to all this, I'm noticing there is not a phone call coming into this office. There isn't a typewriter going. Nobody's moving. Everybody's listening to their boss. I mean, this man is being honest in front of his whole office. I appreciate it, Al, let me tell you. Then he said, the minister opened his Bible and he read to him John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Then he turned his Bible to John 6, 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And then he turned to John eleven twenty five and read that as well. And then he looked at my friend Al and he says, now... If you were to die today, would you be saved? And Al said, yes, I believe so. He says, then you are a Christian and you have eternal life. Then Al said, you know, I admire your enthusiasm. I used to have that kind of zeal when I went on my missions. And the minister said, missions? Missions? Are you a Mormon? And Al, Al says, well, yes, I am. He says, well, I'm sorry. He closes his Bible. He says, Mormons will not be in the kingdom. And he walks away. Yeah. Now I want to ask you a question. Are the Mormons our enemy? I mean, this poor man, as I got to know him, he was raised in the Mormon church. He, he was brought up this way. He believed this way. I'm not saying their beliefs are necessarily correct. But this man honestly believes some of these things. Just because somebody thinks differently than we do, or has a different theology, it doesn't make them our enemy, does it? What are you doing with those that think differently than you are? What is your attitude and your approach? What did Jesus Christ do when Jim Holmberger thought differently than him? He says, while Jim is yet a sinner, I will what? I will die for him. That's the attitude that we should have to our brethren whether they, they're in our church and think differently, or they're of a different denomination, or they're worldly. They're not our enemy. And we shouldn't approach them that way. But my poor friend now, Al, is confused. And so he's looking at me. As Al finished the story, he said, Jim, help my confusion, would you? Can you shed some light on this subject? Now, Al wasn't concerned about his unfair treatment. That's not what Al was saying. Al was struggling with the deeper issue of how to know, really know, if he was saved or whether he was lost. And although I believe that the young minister was sincere, and I believe he was, so were the Jews, but their intellectual scent and concepts and their church affiliation were not enough. And I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, tonight, too, you're not saved by the church you go to. And you're not saved by the knowledge that you have of truth. And you're not saved by your reforms. True Christianity goes beyond intellectual assent and church affiliation. And I'm sitting there, and Al wants an answer. And guess what? His secretaries and his factory crew want an answer, because everybody's listening. I don't have the slightest idea what I'm going to say. I learned by living in the woods, in the mountains, if you will. That's what Escape to God is all about. My pastor, my church, got up in front of the church, and he says, I can, I can summarize Jim Homer's book in one sentence. I thought, this ought to be good. 
he says, it's having an ear that's sensitive to God. And I thought, very good. He did good. He read the book. And right now, I need an ear that's sensitive to God because there is no Bible study that's prepared in advance. I can hand Al and answer his questions. Al wants a personal answer, and Al deserves a personal answer, doesn't he? And so I'm just petitioning God right now because I need help. I'm just saying, Lord, give me the wisdom. Help me explain to Al the gospel in its simplest terms. And so I looked at Al, and I said, Al, can I have a piece of paper? And he hands me a piece of paper. And on that piece of paper, I wrote down, the Christian life is not, capital N-O-T, merely doctrines. Al looks at me, I says, it's not creeds. And he looks at me, I said, it's not reforms, it's not church membership, it's not church attendance, it's not outreach, and it's not missions. Poor Al. I mean, you should have seen the guy, he just, I mean, that, that was his whole Christian life, that was his whole Christian experience. And I just wiped it all out. Just took it all away. And he's looking at me. And I said, Al, the Christian life is made up of a bundle of choices. And I drew a bundle. I'm not much of an artist. But I drew a bundle on the sheet of paper. And I said, when God brings a truth or light to our understanding, it always comes with a choice. We must choose to submit or we can choose to refuse to it. And when God has all our known choices, he has me. That's all that God wants. He wants all my known choices surrendered to him. I said, Al, do you remember the thief on the cross? He says, yes, I do. I says, he didn't know a lot, did he? He says, no, he didn't. I says, let's say for the purposes of discussion, there's a total of 100 choices in the whole Christian realm that you can have. Now, the thief on the cross maybe had five things that he knew about the Christian life, five areas that he was convicted on. But of those five areas, he surrendered all five of those areas to, to Jesus Christ that day on the cross. That's why Christ could assure him of salvation. Not because he had a great knowledge, not because he had any lifestyle reforms. He was probably still drinking Budweiser and smoking Marlboros or whatever. Not because he was a member in good standing of God's denominated body, because he wasn't, was he? And not because he was a great soul winner, but because he had surrendered 100% of all that he was aware of, all his known choices. And had he lived, there would have been an opportunity to advance in the Christian life and to give more to God. What there? I said, now, there was a second man that was living that same day, and his name was Caiaphas. And let's say Caiaphas, out of the whole hundred possible choices in Christianity, he knew of 70. But he was only surrendered to 50. But even though those 50 he was surrendered to, he was 10 times more in numbers surrendered than the thief on the cross was. But Caiaphas, uh, despite his great knowledge and belief and lifestyle and his membership, Caiaphas was in rebellion to God, wasn't he? Because he didn't surrender all that he knew. He gave 50 of the 70 items. See, God has to be Lord of your life. He'll settle for nothing less. And if Caiaphas had been on the cross versus the thief, could Jesus have offered him salvation? And I asked Al that, and Al said, no. And I said, why, Al? He says, because Caiaphas was not 100% surrendered. Caiaphas was in charge. He was in charge. There's a, there's a um, fast food franchise that says what? Have it your way. Isn't that worldly? I mean, isn't that what Lucifer started out with? Have it your way. Then all hell broke out in heaven. Then Eve thought she could have it what? Her way. Now, aren't you God that, glad that God has given us a free moral agency? I am too. But if we are to be gods, we are to surrender everything we know to God, continually. And that's what I'm explaining to Al right now. You can't just have it your way. God requires the same of all, I told Al. And it's not knowledge, it's not performance, but it's surrender of all your known choices to the present will of Jesus Christ. 
Luke 12, 48 says, Much is required from those to whom much is given. And I looked at Al and I said, Al, do you see the fairness of God? And Al says, yes. And I said, now I want to ask you three questions, Al. And I looked around the office. And I mean, nothing is happening in this office. I, have, I mean, it was incredible. Not a phone was ringing. Not a typewriter was typing. And this man is being honest with me. I appreciate Al. I said, Al, my first question is this. Do you believe that Jesus came to the earth as your substitute and paid the price for your sins? He says, yes, Jim, I do. I said, that's good. I said, my second question is this. Do you love the Lord with all of your heart, minds, and soul? And he says, Jim, yes, I do. And I said, praise God, Al. I said, but this is my third question. I said, you must also have Jesus as your Lord of your life. Are you at this moment fully in submission to all your known choices? Ooh. Al looked at me. He looked around to his secretaries. And he said, Jim, no, I'm not. I appreciate this man. I mean, I want to tell you, I really appreciate this man. I looked at Al and I said, then you are in charge and not God. Is that right? He said, yes, that's right. I said, that's what got us all in the trouble. That's what got Lucifer in the trouble. That's what got Eve in the trouble. And I said, that's what got Judas in the trouble. So I said, Al, if your case was decided right now today, at this moment, could you say to Jesus, Father, forgive Al, for he knows not what he does. He says, no, I could not. I said, then you are in known resistance, just as Caiaphas. And he says, you're right, Jim. This was a solemn moment in this office. What about you tonight, honestly? If your case was decided tonight, is there any known resistance to you? I'm not saying, have you stumbled and fallen? The best of us stumble and fall. You can read Moses' record. You can read many of the records in the Bible. But I'm talking about known resistance, where you are knowingly resisting God in your heart. Say, no, God. No, I'm going to do it my way. Is there any known resistance in you tonight? This is the core issue. You see, self-surrender is the substance of the teachings of Christ. If you read from Genesis all the way through Revelation, self-surrender is the substance of teachings of Christ. That's what he's looking for in us. And when he has it, he'll return. When he gets enough of us, according to Revelation, when he gets his 144,000, that's what he's looking for. Where are you in this? Al had a lot to rethink. Al had trusted in his denominational affiliation. Is that what you're doing? If you're trusting in your denominational affiliation, you're not going to go in the kingdom because you belong to the remnant church of God. The church cannot save one individual. The church is only a tool to connect you to the one that can save you, which is Jesus Christ. That's the work of the church. The church can't save you. Jesus saves you. He had trusted in his missionary work. Now, you think it's good to do missionary work? But it doesn't save you. He had trusted in his better lifestyle. I have a better lifestyle. I gave up my alcohol and my cigarettes. I gave up things in my, my diet. You know, and I eat carrots and bananas, but I can eat a bushel bash of, of carrots and bananas and it's not going to save me. I'm not against them. They give me a healthy life, a good body, but that doesn't save me. Al had trusted in his conceptual understandings. Only Jesus saves, and he can only save those who surrender all their own choices to him. If it's a little bundle he gives you like the thief on the, cre on the cross, that's all he requires. If it's a large bundle like Caiaphas, that's what he requires. You see, becoming a Christian may be a one-time choice, but remaining a Christian is not a one-time choice. But rather, it's a moment-by-moment, -moment, continuous choice to let God have all of me, day in and day out. I am to live for Jesus in total abandonment to him. That is my focus. It is to have, let him have his will in my life all day, every day. That's living by grace, through faith. We're told that you are saved by grace through faith. I never knew what grace was. I had to move up in the mountains of Montana before I found out what grace was in my marriage. 
And it's very simple. Grace is God's presence with me, tapping me on my shoulder saying, Jim, treat your wife gently. You see, sometimes my wife crosses my will. Can you believe something that pretty could ever cross this German's will? I mean, one day I, I'm in the bathroom and I'm washing my hands. And my wife comes up to me and, she, and I get my hands all full of soap and she says, What you doing, dear? I'm going like, what do you mean, what am I doing? That's a stupid question. Can't you see I'm washing my hands? That's what my flesh is saying to me, right? Yeah. And the Lord is speaking to me over here saying, treat her gently, Jim. That's his grace. I can do nothing that's right without God first prompting it in me. He's tapping me on the shoulder and saying, Jim, treat her gently. And now faith is I've got a choice. I can surrender those thoughts, those fleshly thoughts, to the lordship of Jesus Christ, or I can act upon them. That's the life of faith. And when I look at my wife and say, washing my hands, dear, now I'm a free man. I don't have to listen to that old man inside anymore, do I? I don't have to listen to that Hitler in me. I can let a Luther come out. That's how you're saved by grace. And if you're not saved that way with your queen at home, you're putting on a charade at church. If you can't live with your queen at home and your children at home, you're putting on a face at church. You're playing church. And God doesn't want you just to play to church. He wants you to find him. He wants to empower you. He wants to empower your marriage and your family. That's what I had to find in the mountains. So how does this work? The second illustration I'd like to share with you is about Connie. It's one of the hardest cases I've ever ran into. She was in her mid-40s. She was about 5 feet 6 inches tall. She was over 200 pounds. She had been divorced three times. She was molested as a child. She was molested again as a teenager. Her son, her oldest son was in jail. When her youngest son got out of jail, he tried to strangle her. She came to one of our camp meetings. She was putting up her tent. I was walking to the meeting to have a camp meeting. She says, Brother Umberger, Brother Umberger, wait up. She says, I've got to tell you something. And I says, well, what is it? She says, I've come to the camp meeting to find my husband. And I kind of stood there and I thought, yeah, I hope you do find your husband here, your spiritual husband. And I prayed for Connie, that, that camp meeting. I prayed for her throughout, because she always sat right in front, right in the front. And so, but Connie had such a personality that if she sat down at a picnic table where there's a lot of people, they soon left. And I see Connie, she'd be walking down the sidewalk, and people would just part and move out of her way. She had one of those kinds of personalities. She was very abrasive. She always sat in the front row, and this time she was sitting in the front row, a whole family came in and wanted to sit in the front row, and they asked her to move down, and she got her spirit wounded. And I was on my way. I wasn't speaking at that meeting. I was on my way. I was going to stop in the, the men's room, which was out in kind of like a park-like setting, because I was going to, on my way to a counseling session. She saw me walk into the men's room. I didn't know it. So I'm in the men's room. She lay down in front of the men's room's door bawling her eyes out. I don't know this. I come walking out, open the men's room's door, and here's Connie. And she is just laying on the ground crying. I said, Lord, give me the grace. What am I going to do with Connie? What are you people doing with the Connies? These are hurting women today. These are children of God. Made in the image of God. I don't care what she's been through. She's a child of God. She's part of my family. What are we doing with the Connies today? And so I said, Lord, give me the grace. And you know what the devil said to me? Jim, this is going to take hours. Don't forget you got an appointment in a couple minutes, Jim. This is a lone woman. It's not good for you to be out here alone with this woman. This is too difficult of a case, Jim. Just there's no hope for her. She's a lost cause. I said, Lord, Acts 6, what would thou? What do you want me to do, Lord? If you're really my Lord, then you're in charge. You see, it's about choices, isn't it? I have a choice now. This is a choice for me. Am I really the ser Lord's servant? Will the Lord really speak to me? Devil's saying, Jim, step over her. Send someone else down to help her. 
And the Lord brought to my mind vividly the Good Samaritan. Isn't God good? I mean, right in my mind, I could see the Good Samaritan. So I said, Lord, this is a divine appointment, isn't it? Just like Al. And the Lord says, this is a divine appointment. I took my suit coat off. I laid it on the fence. I put my Bible down. And I sat down on the ground right across from her. I looked at Connie. And all I said was two words. And it's the last two words I got in for 30 minutes. I said, I'm here. That's all I said. And Connie started to pour herself out for the next 30 minutes. She told me her entire story. She says, everyone has left her. Everyone has turned on her. She was planning her suicide. I didn't know that. She says, I've cried out to God, but he doesn't change me. I want to be changed, but God won't change me. And as I looked at Connie, I sensed all of humanity was encompassed in Connie. All of us are a mess, brothers and sisters. To a greater or lesser degree, we're all a Connie, aren't we? I looked at Connie. I said, Connie, what did Jesus see in Mary Magdalene? I said, did he see her past or did he see her future? You see, when Jesus looks at you, he doesn't just see your past or your present. He sees what you can be in him in the future. That's how Jesus sees the Connies. And I said to Connie, I said, you know Mary Magdalene became Jesus' most devoted follower? In fact, I said, Mary Magdalene was the first that Jesus appeared to after his resurrection. She said, well, I'm worse. I said, would you like to become a Mary Magdalene? Can I, she said. I mean, she sat up. She was rolling on the ground, crying, screaming before. She sat up. She says, can I? And I says, do you really think I can, she says. I says, do you, do you want to? She says, I want to. And hope was reborn in this woman's soul. You should have sat there. You should have seen this happening. She's sitting up. No, she's smiling. I can be a Mary Magdalene? I said, if you choose. Choose, she says. I can choose? Are you sure I can choose? I don't believe I can choose. You're not playing with me, Mr. Holmberg. Are you sure I can choose? Can I really choose? She says, all they told me when I came into church was to just believe. What are we doing to the Connies? The devil believes, brothers and sisters, but the devil does not choose. She says, all they told me to do was believe, and I was saved, and I'd be a new creature. And she says, I've been asking God, believing he would change me, but he doesn't change me. Oh my, God help us in our evangelism with the Connies of this world. And I looked at Connie, I said, no, Connie, not in yourself you can't choose. You are doomed to failure. Because all you understand is the voice of your natural reasoning, the voice of your flesh and your emotions. But by God's grace, he will influence your next choices. What do you mean by God's grace? I says, God is going to speak to you. God doesn't speak to me, she says. I says, God does speak to you. He says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. She says, nobody ever told me God speaks to me. I've been speaking to him, but he doesn't speak back. I says, he does, Connie. And when you understand how God speaks to your conscience, not audibly, but personably, and he, he taps you on the shoulder and he wants to help you out of your ways, and when you understand how to surrender your choice to God, whenever he speaks to you, you become a new creature. God gets you out of the ditch. I don't. Your church doesn't. But God does. That's the work of the Holy Spirit upon the heart. And if you learn how to cooperate with your choice, God will make you a Mary Magdalene. And this woman is coming alive. You talk about a person being born again? She's finally got home. She never understood what grace was. She never understood how to respond by faith. I said, before man can choose right, God must first work it in your heart. And as he works it in the heart, if you understand how that works, then you can choose. This is the life of God in the soul and is man's only hope. There had been no hope for Jim Holmberger if God didn't pursue me first. There's no credit in what I do. There's no credit in my choice. But God influences my choice. And as I exercise that power of my will to choose what God has put in me, I become a new creature. And I can choose it again and again and I can let it go, too, can I? And I said, Connie, when you learn how to choose it continuously, now there's hope. 
For the first time, this girl is hearing the gospel in its most practical form. You see, faith is not just a belief in God's word. Faith also incorporates a surrender of your choice and a dependence upon a power outside of yourself. That's faith. It goes beyond a knowledge of the scriptures and deals with surrender and dependence as well. Grace and faith are a gift of God, but the power to exercise them is ours. Connie kept waiting for God to do what God was waiting for Connie to do. We must open that gift, brothers and sisters, and I open that gift every day. It's my privilege. It does you no good. If I give you a gift, and you take that gift home, and you put it on your shelf, that gift does you no saving good unless you what? And his grace is a gift. You can't merit it. You can't earn it. It is there always. But you've got to open it. God will never take that from you because God never forces himself. He never compels you. It's always a free will choice on your side. Every moment of every hour of every day. You can choose God or you cannot choose God. Isn't he good? What a risk he took when he gave us such a gift. She looked at me and she says, tell me again, I never knew this. I always thought God mysteriously did it. I've been waiting for God to change me and he never does. I says, he will, but never without your permission and cooperation. Grace is a continuous call from God. That's why James 1.19 says, let every man be swift to what? What are we supposed to hear? Yeah, let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger. The power is in the swift to hear. Saving faith is the act of the soul in which the whole man is given over to the guardianship and control of Jesus Christ. The power of choice God has given to every person. It is theirs to exercise. We can choose to serve him. So we discussed her TV romance movies. We discussed her junk food diet. We discussed her thoughts and her feelings. And I began to tell her that God's grace would be there and I began to explain to her she had to be listening. And she looked at me and she says, bless her little heart, I love her. She says, isn't it hard? Her sincerity was sweet. And I said, Connie, getting pulled out of the ditch is always hard. But staying out of it is a lot easier once you're out. And I said, when you learn how to get out of the ditch, then hope is yours. And so I explained to her, a simple illustration of a rope. And I'd like to close with this if I could. And I hope that you catch the understanding of the simple illustration. You see, when God made man, they were one. They were together. They were in harmony like this rope. Every thread was intertwined. Every fiber was connected. God and man were one, just like this rope was. And then man's choice severed that connection with God like this rope. And God says, I don't want to let man go. You know, he had a choice. He could have scrapped the human race. You know that. But he says, I love man too much. I don't want to scrap the human race. So what does God do? God wants to engraft man and God back together again. That's the gospel. It's no more complicated than that. God is the vine, right? Jesus is the vine. And he wants to engraft us into the vine. And how does God do that? He does it choice by choice fiber by fiber. So I explained to Con, Connie, I said, this is you, Connie. You're this, you're this severed rope presently. This is Connie, this is God. And I said, God wants to take every fiber of your being, see, the, see this, these fibers here in this rope? And I said, God wants to come to you, Connie, and he looks at you. He knows that it's too much to take all of you at once. None of us could handle it, could we? I couldn't handle it. Moses was in the wilderness for how many years? I've only been there 20. I hope I get another 20. But God comes to us. This is how God works in its simplest form. God comes to us and says, Connie, I want your fiber of irritation. And he taps you on the shoulder. Somebody crosses your will. Maybe you're driving down the road or your son says something. Somebody crosses your will and you're getting irritated. He taps you on the shoulder and says, Connie, give me your irritation. And now you've come to recognize his call to your conscience. You say, God, you can have it. And God takes you through that that again and again, and finally, God has your irritation. And now you're looking like this. Now you're connected, that fiber's connected. Then God comes to you, and he t picks out a second fiber. And Connie, you know, she likes to go to the refrigerator. Her size is obvious to that. I don't look down around that. 
She was raised differently than I was. She has a different problem. You know, I don't mind people's sins being different than mine and their weaknesses. And just because a person, just because I'm thinner and someone's heavier, doesn't mean I'm any better than they are. Maybe I have pride. What is worse, pride or appetite? Yeah. Don't ever look to your brothers and sisters if they have a weakness that you don't and throw say, what's their problem? Well, it's the same as yours. You're in charge of something. And in hers, it was her diet. And so I said, now God comes to you and he's got one of your fibers connected. He's going to knock on your tap on your shoulder next time you go to the refrigerator and you're pulling out your hot dogs and you're pulling out your chocolate sundaes, you know, and you're, you're pulling out your, your french fries and whatever. And he's going to say, Connie, don't you like carrots and bananas? And Connie's going to say, oh yes, Lord, I do, but I've got to get away from the refrigerator. So you're going to go out for a walk. And you're going to get away from that temptation. And when you come back, you're going to be in control, and you're going to give God your appetite, and you're going to eat those carrots and bananas. And guess what? You're going to go through that enough, and now you're going to have two fibers connected. And God's smiling, isn't he? The devil's mad. He says, Connie's got a problem with gossip. So now, Connie, you hear some. That's the third fiber. Are you with me? And so God systematically begins to take each of us through all the areas of our life. And that can be your passions. That can be your impulses. It can be your pride or gossip. It can be your schedules. It can be your busyness. It can be your thoughts and your feelings. But one at a time or two, whatever God decides, he begins to take you through. Pretty soon, there comes a point in somebody's life, and they've cooperated with God entirely, and half of the fibers are connected. But all God has called for is half of the fibers, right? And guess what? If that person dies, guess what? They're going to be my brother in heaven. They're going to be my brother in heaven because they had surrendered 100% of everything that God had asked for. Are you with me? Then he comes to the, um, oh, the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler looked like this. Everything was connected except for one fiber. Wow. Wouldn't you like to be in that position? And God looks at the rich young ruler and says, All that you have done, but one thing thou lackest. And the rich young ruler said, No. Ooh. Lucifer said no to one thing, brothers and sisters. One thing. Judas said what? No. That scares me. Are you with me on this? You see, there's a high cost to low choices, isn't there? If we hold out on God like Caiaphas did, we're lost in the end. How many of your fibers does God have right now? Do you know? I know. I cooperate with God every day. I know how many of my fibers he has, and I know what fibers he's asking for. I know what he's working on me right now with. I have an intimate relationship with my God. Now, are you holding out on any choices with God? If you say no, I say, praise God. If you say yes, I say, guess what? He's going to take you around the circle again. God's long-suffering. His mercy endures forever. If you say no to God, God doesn't throw you out. God says, guess what? We're going to go through this thing again and again and again. Have you ever noticed those circles get bigger? Every time God takes me back around the same thing again, it's bigger. I said to Sal, I'm going to get smart one of these days. I'm just going to give in right away. Because <laughs> the trials get, just get harder in the same area. Have you ever noticed that? That's how it is with me. You know, I'm still, I'm a stubborn German. You know, God has a hard time. How many of you are German? God help you. And you Frenchmen and your Spaniards and whatever else too. We're all that way, aren't we? You see, to abide in Christ is to surrender all our known choices to Christ in the present moment. That's a living Christian. It's just that simple. Now, I've got three questions to ask you before I close. First question is simple. Can Connie become a Mary Magdalene? Yes. There's hope for every Connie, isn't there? Can Al, who is a Mormon, find salvation in Jesus Christ? Amen. Can you and I become a Mary Magdalene? 
a Daniel, a Paul. Yes, every one of us can. If we will cooperate with God in all our known choices. When I got home, I had a card in the mail from Connie. I'm not going to read the card, but I want to read the back. She's a very colorful woman. I want to read what, what, and I'll close with this, but I want to read what she said in the back of this envelope. Bless her little heart. She writes on here, she says, I told God I needed a story to tell. Amen. Thank you for showing me the gospel. I always wondered what it was. She puts a smiley face here, and then she writes here, Jesus is my husband. She did come to the camp meeting to find the husband. And it was Jesus. Praise God. That's the work of the gospel. Introducing the Connies to Jesus and turning their cases over to Jesus Christ. Would you kneel with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, I want to thank you again. I want to thank you for the free moral agency that you give to Jim Holmberg. I thank you for that power of choice, Lord, that I can choose you every moment of every hour of every day. But more than my choice, Lord, I want to thank you for your grace. Because if it wasn't your grace speaking to my heart, if it wasn't the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life, I wouldn't even know what I should choose, Lord. You're the one that works in my heart and my soul, my mind, my conscience, what I should do. And by responding to that, Lord, you turn me into a new creature. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you bless every one of us as we exercise that power of choice by grace through faith. In Jesus' name, amen.